Walkman. Some things from the past are hardly seen nowadays, and younger people might not know what they are. However, I always keep a little XL1 on hand, because you never know when you may need it. If you recognize most items from today's list, it means you're getting older. But don't worry, it just means you've lived a full life. Everything I need in my new Trapper portfolio. Trapper? Traps in all my papers. The pocket's this way, so... I close the trap. Old items that only experienced people recognize are often outdated or useless. You have a unique skill in using old technologies that younger people might not understand. So you're still useful even if you're considered an old timer. Join us as we explore the third part of the 20 funny and nostalgic things. You might be old if you remember these things. Even after 500 plays, our High Fidelity tape still delivers High Fidelity. Doo-wop, a harmonic music style popular in African-American communities during the 1950s, thrived in major U.S. cities like New York, Philadelphia, and Chicago. This genre, practiced under streetlights and in stairwells, produced enchanting harmonies. Doo-wop stands out for its vocal group harmony, creating catchy melodies to a simple beat with minimal instruments. The lyrics are straightforward, often revolving around love, sung by a lead vocalist with supporting background vocals. The song sometimes includes a heartfelt section addressing the beloved. A distinct feature is the harmonic singing of nonsense syllables like doo-wop. While it gained popularity in the 1950s, its artistic and commercial success waned by the early 1960s, though it continued to influence other genres. Notably, female doo-wop singers were rare initially. Still, figures like Lillian Leach and Margot Sylvia paved the way for women in doo-wop, soul, and R and B. Doo-wop played a big role in shaping today's music, influencing genres like pop, rock and roll, R and B, and even jazz, with artists like Sun Ra exploring it. The old doo-wop songs often have a sad and thoughtful vibe in their lyrics. As the doo-wop era fades into memory, its melancholic tunes echo through time. But what of the rebels who dared to challenge societal norms? Let's explore beatnik's culture. The 1950s wasn't just about cool fashion and music, it was also the time of the beatniks. The beat generation rebelled against society's rules in the 50s, changing literature, music, and art. These rebels, mostly writers, wanted to break free from traditional thinking and express themselves in new ways. They explored deep topics like spirituality, sex, drugs, and different lifestyles. This cool group included friends like Jack Kerouac, Allen Ginsberg, William S. Burroughs, and Neil Cassidy. They shared ideas and created a unique style of writing. The beats inspired people to find themselves and break free from from society's expectations. Faces, beards, blue jeans, sneakers. There's not a sound, you know what I mean, really sound businessman amongst them. Their alternative lifestyles, like living together and exploring Eastern ideas, also influenced the hippie movement. Beatnik writers spoke against the establishment, and many young people, unhappy with society, turned to drugs like marijuana and LSD to rebel and seek meaning beyond mainstream culture. In the late 1940s, Edwin H. Land and his team at the Polaroid Corporation developed the Polaroid process, transforming instant photography. The Land camera, introduced in 1948, used a unique roll film with negative and positive sheets and a special chemical layer. How do you know what they want for Christmas? I even know who's been good and who's been bad. The breakthrough was the self-developing film, allowing users to get a developed photo within minutes, eliminating the need for traditional film processing. Swing it up, it says yes, take the shot, count it down, tip it off. After taking a picture, the photographer waited a minute or two for the image to develop. A clear plastic sheet, often called peel-apart film, covered the photo to protect it from light and air. This also prevented fading and damage. New system with a piece of the sun inside. It can turn bad light into good pictures. What's wrong with that sun? It's never where you want it. Like now. Polaroid had a resurgence in the 2010S when the Impossible Project acquired the last Polaroid factory 
producing instant film for vintage cameras. But in 2017, they rebranded as Polaroid Originals. As instant photography revolutionized with Polaroid in 1948, Atari brought the gaming craze in the late 70s. From self-developing films to video game consoles, a leap in entertainment. What did Atari's decisions mean for the gaming world? Let's find out. During the late 1970s, arcade video games became popular. Atari Inc. was a big part of this, famous for making the Pong game in arcades in 1972. Attention shoppers, the new Atari cartridge game is in. Excuse me. <laughs> Uh-oh. They made a gaming console called the Atari VCS, Video Computer System in 1977, later called the 2600 in 1982. It cost $199 and came with two joysticks and a game called Combat. Other games like Space Invaders were sold separately. Atari also tried to make computers like the Apple II and Commodore PET, but they didn't do well. Atari made bad decisions, overspent on failed projects, and cut corners on making games like E.T. This upset customers. Atari. Sorry. Only our demonstrators left. Mine! No, George. Mine. The new video computer system by Atari. And in 1983, the video game industry crashed. Atari's sales went down fast, and they had to sell off parts of their company. The Atari 2600 kept selling until 1992 when it was discontinued. In the 1970s, roller disco was a fun activity that mixed roller skating with disco music and cool outfits. It was a big hit and became popular during that time. People would go to roller rinks, special places just for roller skating, and skate around to disco songs. The roller rinks were often decorated with flashy lights and colorful decorations to make it feel like a disco party. People loved roller disco because it combined two things they enjoyed, roller skating and dancing to disco music. It was a way for friends and families to have a good time together while getting some exercise. Dressing up in funky disco outfits with bell-bottom pants, colorful shirts, and glittery accessories was all part of the fun. Roller disco captured the spirit of the 70s nightlife and the roller skating craze that lasted into the early 80s, creating many happy memories for those who experienced it. As the disco lights dim and the roller rink echoes with laughter, you must wonder what other funky trends from the 70s await rediscovery. Let's explore it together. In the 1970s, moon boots became a popular choice for fashionable and practical winter footwear. These puffy, comfortable boots, resembling marshmallows for your feet, came in various bright colors, adding a touch of flashiness to the wearer's outfit. Kids especially loved them, feeling like astronauts or characters from their favorite sci-fi movies. Interestingly, the name Moon Boots wasn't just catchy. It was inspired by the Apollo moon landing, adding a nostalgic and adventurous vibe to the boots. But in 2017, the moon boot returned to the fashion world, proving that trends often circle back around. Whether for practical winter wear or to add a retro flair to their outfits, many longed for a pair of these timeless boots. In the 1970s, the afro wasn't just a hairstyle. It symbolized pride and cultural identity, especially during the civil rights movement. The afro was popularized by people of African descent who wanted to embrace their natural hair texture and rebel against societal norms that promoted Eurocentric beauty standards. You need this afro sheen hairspray to give your hair sparkle. Mmm, that smells nice too. It was a way for individuals to express their heritage and assert their identity in a society that often marginalized people of color. The Afro hairstyle is created by combing out the natural growth of Afro-textured hair or styling it with chemical curling products. It forms a distinctive curl pattern, shaping the hair into a rounded cloud or puffball. People with straight or wavy hair used permanent structure-changing creams or gels to achieve this style particularly popular in the African community during the early 1970s, the afro was often shaped and maintained with the help of an afro pick, a wide-toothed comb. As the 1970s witnessed the rise of the iconic afro hairstyle, a symbol of cultural pride, the next exploration unfolds with another trend, waterbeds. How did bedroom comfort evolve alongside cultural expressions? Let's find out. Waterbeds were a cool and trendy bedroom furniture item in the 1970s and 1980s, symbolizing the era's desire for comfort and uniqueness. These unique beds or mattresses were filled with water, and their roots can be traced back to the 19th century for medical purposes. 
However, the modern version, invented in San Francisco and patented in 1971, became a hit in the United States during the 80s, comprising up to 22% of the market at its peak in 1987. There were two main types of waterbeds, hard-sided and soft-sided. The hard-sided ones had a water-filled mattress inside a wooden frame, while the soft-sided ones had a mattress enclosed in foam and fabric, resembling a traditional bed. Initially, waterbeds had a free-flow design with significant wave motion, but later models introduced wave-reducing techniques like fiber batting. Despite their popularity in the past, by 2013 they only accounted for less than 5% of new bed sales. In the 1970s, CB radios became all the rage, creating a unique subculture and changing how people communicated on the road. Al Gross, the inventor of the walkie-talkie, came up with the CB radio in 1945. Now, wherever I drive in any kind of weather, I feel safe. This switch is my instant shortcut to emergency channel 9, one of 11 front panel features. Initially used by small businesses and blue-collar workers like carpenters and plumbers, it became more affordable for regular folks by 1960. The 23-channel CB radio gained massive popularity in 1973, coinciding with the oil crisis. A cable leads to this mic speaker unit with volume, squelch, and digital channel readout. It even disconnects, so you can lock it away. Truckers and everyday people embraced CB radios for on-the-road communication, creating a craze that impacted popular culture. Handles or nicknames like Rubber Duck and Smokey became part of the CB radio language. On today's highways, you need the security of a dependable CB radio. So do what I did. Get a realistic CB at radio. These radios facilitated practical communication and created a sense of community among users. It was a unique time in American history thanks to these little radios that connected people on the road. As CB radios created a unique on-the-road culture connecting people in the 1970s, what about the impact of VCRs in the 1980s? How did these devices transform home entertainment? In the 1980s, VCRs, video cassette recorders, and video cassettes revolutionized how people enjoyed entertainment at home. A VCR is a machine that records both sound and moving pictures from TV or other sources onto tapes, allowing playback at a later time, a practice commonly known as time shifting. This makes a great video value too. The HR7100, simplicity in motion from JVC. This technology made it possible for individuals to watch movies and recorded TV shows in the comfort of their homes, changing the way people consume media. Slacks, Panasonic VHS tapes up to four hours of sports, movie specials on one cassette. During the 80s and 90s, pre-recorded tapes, most notably in the VHS format, became widely available for purchase and rental. Blank tapes were also sold, enabling users to record their favorite programs. Scared the fish. But we're missing the big football Relax. game. Relax! My VHS home video recorder is taping it right now. However, as technology advanced, VCRs lost popularity in the 2000s, and in July 2016, Funai Electric, the last manufacturer, stopped production. The legacy of VCRs and video cassettes remains a significant chapter in the history of home entertainment. In the 1980s, fashion was all about standing out with vibrant and flashy styles, and neon clothing played a significant role in defining the era's look. Neon colors like bright greens and electric blues became a fashion statement thanks to advancements in technology that allowed the creation of bold, eye-catching fabrics. This trend wasn't limited to one group, it found its place in various subcultures. The fitness and aerobics craze saw the rise of neon workout gear including leotards, leg warmers, and headbands, adding a fun and energetic vibe to exercise routines. Neon colors also infiltrated casual and streetwear, making everyday fashion pop with bold hues. Even high-end fashion embraced the neon trend, bringing the bold and bright palette to the forefront of style during this vibrant decade. As neon colors illuminated the 1980s fashion scene, the vibrant hues amplified the era's energy. Yet amidst the bold styles, what soundtrack accompanied this flashy revolution? These are the Walkman portable cassette players. In the 1980s, Sony's Walkman portable cassette players revolutionized how people enjoyed music on the go. These devices, introduced in 1979, let individuals listen to their favorite tunes privately while moving around. It's a tiny stereo cassette player with truly incredible sound. 
Originally, the Walkman was a portable cassette player which became immensely popular during the 1980s and turned Walkman into a general term for personal stereos. Over time, the Walkman brand evolved to include digital formats like Minidisc and CD, with the latter initially named the Discman and later rebranded as the CD Walkman. Put on a Walkman and see the world in a whole new light. Sony Walkman. The Walkman from Sony, the one and only. By the end of production in 2010, a whopping 220 million cassette-type Walkman were sold, and the total sales, including digital Walkman devices like Discman and memory-type media players, reached approximately 400 million by 2022. Every school kid wanted a Trapper Keeper in the 1980s, a vibrant, three-ring binder with Velcro closures known for its colorful designs and practical paper storage. This iconic school accessory was a must-have for students serving as their first organizational system and a symbol of productivity. The Trapper Keeper was carefully designed through market research by a Harvard MBA at Mead, a major paper company. By 1989, it was reported that half of students in grades 6 through 12 owned one. I figured there are basically two kinds of people, those who can't get it together and those who can't. However, the Trapper Keeper faced challenges as school authorities deemed it too large and the availability of diverse designs began to shrink due to limited shelf space in stores. Despite its eventual decline, the Trapper Keeper remains a cherished memory, representing an era of school life filled with color and functionality. They don't fall out. I've got a trapper for every subject, and the Trapper Keeper holds them all with this Velcro closure and tough new Duracell construction. As the Trapper Keeper era fades, one might ask, what other iconic trends shaped school memories? Let's discover the intricate artistry of macrame in our next exploration. Macrame, a crafting trend from the 1970s, involves knotting cords or strings to create decorative and functional items like plant hangers and wall hangings. This ancient craft is a simple and affordable way to add a personal touch to your home decor. Macrame creations can take various forms, from plant hangers and clothing to wall hangings, dream catchers, and more. Macrame is unique because it requires no tools, just your hands. You can use it to fashion various items, including necklaces, bracelets, curtains, tablecloths, coasters, and keychains. The vast possibilities allow you to experiment with different knot combinations, bead additions, and material choices like leather strips, cotton rope, yarn, jute, ribbon, nylon cord, or the popular hemp cord. Whether tied on a wooden frame or suspended from the ceiling, macrame offers endless creative opportunities for beginners and seasoned crafters. Psychedelic art emerging in the 1960s was a vibrant and abstract form of artistic expression inspired by psychedelic experiences, often induced by drugs like LSD, psilocybin, and DMT. Psychedelic means mind manifesting, encompassing all attempts to depict the mind's inner workings. In the late 1960s, psychedelic art became closely associated with the counterculture movement. Characterized by distorted and surreal visuals, bright colors, and animated designs, it aimed to convey or enhance psychedelic experiences. This art movement extended beyond traditional forms, manifesting in concert posters, album covers, liquid light shows, murals, and even comic books. These visuals captured the swirling colors of psychedelic visions and reflected revolutionary sentiments inspired by the political, social, and spiritual insights gained from altered states of consciousness. As the vivid colors of psychedelic art fade into the past, a new technological era emerges. Laser disc players, once cutting edge, brought superior quality to home entertainment. Laser disc players were a type of home video player available from the late 1970s. They used laser discs, the first commercial optical disc storage medium, MCA Disco Vision. Then Pioneer gives me their laser disc player. It's a video turntable that works with a laser beam, and that laser beam makes all the difference, they tell me. These discs were about 12 inches wide. Unlike today's DVDs and Blu-rays, laser discs didn't use digital technology. They worked with analog signals. Compared to VHS and Betamax, the other popular home video formats at the time, Laserdiscs offered better picture and sound quality. However, they were expensive and couldn't record TV shows, making them less popular in North America. Higher cost less than 500. Put it this way, we're watching a great movie. And you're watching us. 
but they did become more popular in the 1990s, in places like Japan, Hong Kong, Singapore, and Malaysia, where people were willing to spend more on technology, laser discs were a big hit. They were loved by movie buffs for their superior quality. Listen to Duran Duran. I listen to Raiders of the Lost Ark. I even listen to me, and I sound good. I sound better than good. Even though laser discs eventually lost popularity to newer formats like CDs, DVDs, and Blu-rays, they paved the way for these technologies. Production of LaserDisc players stopped in 2009. Leisure suits were popular outfits for men in the 1970s, made from a shiny, cheap material called polyester. They were known for their casual style, consisting of a jacket that looked like a shirt and matching pants. Dacron, polyester and cotton wash and wear suits. Business suits and Dacron and wool tropicals are all Dacron. People in the United States liked them because they were affordable and less formal than traditional suits. However, leisure suits are often laughed at or made fun of nowadays. This is because they are seen as a symbol of the 1970s when fashion was sometimes over the top and flashy. In a large selection of colors and sizes, get your versatile Farrah leisure suit in the men's department at Donaldson's, your Christmas store. The shiny material and flashy colors of leisure suits have become associated with tackiness and bad taste. In popular culture, leisure suits are linked to things like bars, gangsters, and people who don't know how to dress well. For example, in the video game series Leisure Suit Larry, the main character wears a leisure suit and is often portrayed as clueless or awkward. As leisure suits faded into fashion history, a new trend emerged with rubber bracelets where fashion meets charity and trends evolve. Rubber bracelets, popularized in the 1980s, gained fame through celebrities and became fashion statements or symbols of support for various causes. These bracelets, often rectangular or circular, are elastic and come in various colors. Initially surfacing in the 1980s, their popularity surged in waves worldwide. During the 2000s, a specific rubber bracelet gained immense popularity for spreading awareness and supporting charitable causes. The Livestrong Yellow Band, introduced in 2004 by cyclist Lance Armstrong, brought attention to cancer awareness. In 2007, wider one-inch bands gained popularity, especially among young concert fans. These bracelets, perceived as trendier than traditional charity pins, serve as both a fashion accessory and a fundraising tool. Affordable to manufacture, wristbands are often priced at $1, with most of the proceeds directed towards supporting charity or cause. In the 1980s, cassette tape boomboxes became the go-to portable music players that symbolized youth culture. These transistorized devices featured one or two cassette tape players, AM, FM, radio, and later in the mid-1990s, a CD player. The sound was amplified through integrated speakers, and the boombox often had a carrying handle for easy portability. Some models could even record music from radio or other sources onto cassette tapes. Originally introduced in the late 1970s, boomboxes gained popularity in the United States by the 1980s, growing in size and weight to a desire for louder bass. They became especially associated with urban communities, particularly among African American and Latino youth earning the nickname Ghetto Blaster. You bother a lot of people with that? Yeah. Bother me? <laughs> Bothers the hell out of me. I think yeah, you're invading well. my life space with that damn. However, the boombox faced backlash, prompting some cities to ban them in public places. Despite controversies, boomboxes played a crucial role in the rise of hip-hop music and became an enduring symbol of a vibrant music and youth culture era. As the era of cassette tape boomboxes faded into memory, what adventures awaited within the pages of Choose Your Own Adventure books? Let's find out. Choose Your Own Adventure Books was a popular series of children's game books in the 1980s, running from 1979 to 1998. These interactive stories put the reader in charge, making decisions that shaped the plot's direction. Created by Edward Packard and initially published as the Adventures of You series, the books engaged seven to 14-year-olds in immersive adventures. Written in the second person, readers assume the role of protagonists like investigators, climbers, or spies. The series, starting with Packard's Sugarcane Island in 1976, spread to 40 languages. Readers could choose their character's role in some books, like opting to be a climber, hiker, or traveler. 
The stories maintain gender and race neutrality, though illustrations sometimes lean towards a presumed male reader. Some protagonists were implied to be children while others were adults. This unique storytelling approach made Choose Your Own Adventure a beloved and globally translated series for young readers.